Well, hi everyone and welcome to the first of the rolling on interviews with people we've met over on our travels over the past couple of years, looking at sessions and sing arounds today, as you can see from my background, you might recognise these good people. We're in Oxford virtually talking to James Bell here, um, who set up a wonderful institution called the Bastard English Session. And uh, here's James and I in conversation about why it's called the bastard session and really all sorts of other things around the scene so i hope you enjoy this is the first one we've done so you'll have to excuse the poor quality of some of the uh, freezing poor old james was uh, having a pretty bad signal but anyway it's thought that counts isn't it so over to james a second i've got some video of what the sessions look like um but it's normally like 100 plus people in a cramped mm. pub room standing mm. on chairs um <laughs> singing kind of either shallow brown or like uh something by prince you know i mean is it like there's we have this thing of well basically we'll start off with traditional tunes often yeah. traditional like cotswold morris tunes and then it will become a bit more general and then we'll do songs and the way yeah. people lurking at the edge will step forward and go pop a clock and i go no no it's not pop a clock yet and then probably one guy josh will just like jump on a chair and start singing sex on the beach or something and then like and then and then it's just everyone's like oh, okay it's, the tune players are like all right pop a clock that's, oh, it's been great see ya and so that's kind of how that dynamic works what what is out in your mind go on i mean so what is it what, what, what would we what, not what, is, have? what would not what would not make you sit there and think yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. I'm glad uh, glad we included that one tonight. What, what's uh... I think it is anything that is kind of deliberately intended to offend somebody. So fascist and anthems be... would be right out kind of thing. Yeah, yeah and also, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know. It's 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 a fun, like there was a funny one with with the um uh, with Fairy Tale of New York, which I played oh, uh, the oh. kind of the, the, yeah. the Christmas session we did, and a lot of people don't like using the word faggot in it. No, and it's true. Yeah. and and have got upset by it. now one of the things that i feel about that is that i think it's a great song yeah. and i think that that word really fits in that song because i feel that that song is not supposed to be like a christmas carol it's yeah. supposed to be like a post watershed i mean like he's singing to a fictional character who is a junkie who is who is dying of a heroin overdose yeah. and you're not going to get like a pleasant response from these people and if you tone that down you don't get like the real experience but for this session i was aware of the fact that it's funny that it shouldn't be a christmas carol but it is a christmas carol let's be realistic so i was happy to change the change the words for that and oh. i don't i'm not going to like stand outside shane mcgowan's house with a placard but like that's one of the curious things to sort of navigate in terms of what's out in terms of genre like the just the weirder the genre, the better. I mean, also I think it's a case of if someone is boring and goes on for like twenty minutes, but we've never had that. But I mean, I think yeah, if yeah. someone is like, but in a way that's kind of a sort of amount of disrespect. But again, if someone just comes up with something kind of insane, we've had like the Crazy Frog, we've had Axel F, we've had, um, uh, I mean, like every pop tune you can think of. We have a lot. I mean, like it, every folk session has got mashups of of kind of um, like singing Pinball Wizard to the tune of Nutting Girl and this sort of stuff. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. a fairly common thing. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I like, in terms of genre, I, like, ago I, where I was going, I, I realized really that the session I was doing was kind of getting out of hand and there were loads of people who wanted to perform and we needed some system yeah, yeah. For, for kind of organizing this. So I, I bought a hat. I bought this like, it's kind of just hat from a party shop yeah, and yeah. you grab the hat and put the hat on if you want to perform. Yeah, yeah. So when I was at uh, Rosie's uh, Shanty session, uh, they have a parrot. And they pass around this stuffed parrot. Um, so so that's become a sort of thing from Sidmouth to, I think she, I don't know whether or not she got that from the bus session, she probably did. And I, I guess your, your, what are your thoughts on um, that then? So, so the main kind of theme is performance versus sharing. Performance yeah. is typified by everybody looks at you, you're out the front stage, blah, blah, versus whatever version of pass the hat or the parrot <laughs> around the room. What's, what's been your experience around that? <laughs> Now, the thing about the Cat Weasel Club is that there isn't a microphone. Mm. You perform, uh, you know, sort of, you know, just, just in the space, that room. Now, I think that makes a huge difference. Yeah, it, yeah, it may yeah. sound like it's, it, it's, it's sort of an odd thing, but one of the things that happens mm. is the Cat Weasel Club is ridiculously supportive and everyone shuts up. And when you perform, you know that everyone is listening. Um, one of the criticisms I've heard people make about the Cat Weasel Club and the Bastard Session 
is that in a way it's too supportive and you can get bad performers who get like lots of applause and they don't like that kind of level of encouragement. Now, like to a certain extent, you know, for the people who are like the hardcore tune players, I can kind of get that. But this is a case of Cat Weasel is very interested in that crossover between performance and sharing. Um, and and the, a lot of the people who will perform at the session will then go and perform at the open mic night and the open mic night. So as I say, there is this kind of crossover. Um, but there is still very much the same sort of the sense of you kind of get rewarded for effort rather than for technical execution. Yeah, yeah. And I actually feel like I wouldn't want that for every event. You know, it's it's not a bad thing to have some events where people are cherry picked and they are like they have practiced a, a lot. In fact, actually, when I was doing the folk weekend thing, I mm. I ran an open mic night to find people to book for the local stages. Oh, yeah. And if someone was competent if someone had practiced and they could deliver to an audience i would book them yeah. but that was a case where you don't just get points for showing up like there were a number of people i'm just like i'm sorry you're not there yet you you know happy to have you at some point but you need to practice more and it's it's really just kind of an experience thing but yeah so in, in terms of kind of performance like i have had nothing but great experiences at the Cat Weasel Club, which I probably enjoy even more than the session that I run. Mm. Um, but I think it is exceptionally well run. When I have been to other open mic nights, it's a totally different deal. One of the key things which has made such a difference, and again, it's coming back to a, 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 a universal thing for me, which is actually all of the things that I really enjoy run by pretty hard rules. I had started coming to the Cat Weasel Club in 2006. And I, second or third time, said to Matt Sage, the guy who was running it, I've got some friends coming. Can I play in the second half? And he said, no. And mm. then just walked off. <laughs> and I'd never had that as a kind of an experience. Yeah. But like he was completely brutal. I was like, no. Um, he is very, like, he's got his particular rules and he's kind of strict with them. And what that means as a difference is that it's not his mate Jezza who's on stage is like, oh, can I just do two more? Like, yeah, go on, Jezza. And everyone's like, oh my God, I'm gonna, and then it's yeah, just yeah. gonna sort of drag on. Like he will keep to time. I mean, this is another thing as well in terms of keeping to time. When yeah, I yeah. start the session online, I start like within 10 seconds. Um, and when I finish at the ISIS, I'm like, I'm looking at a watch and we finish at midnight. And that's another thing which I think means that people feel like they know that it's 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 running to uh like they know that it's just it's kind of organized and that that i think helps people sort of feel like it's an actual it makes them feel thing. like they, so, they can fit in absolutely no clique yeah, i mean so, this thing about trying to get away from cliques although you know it's true yeah. that most people love being in one but, yeah but really you know the, the mood from everybody we've met and we've talked to is is this thing about if i go in for the first time and i feel welcome i'll come back if i go in for the first time i don't feel welcome I probably won't go back because why should i you know what, what the hell have i got a game i'll go but, somewhere else and but that is i find it's difficult to not have cliques happen by accident <laughs> like we work quite hard to try to stop the session from being a clique but once you've got a group of people who who love coming and actually at the cat weasel club i can accidentally create a cliquey atmosphere because there's one of the things about this is it's sort of like a lot of the performers know each other really well yeah. people yeah. came to my wedding this sort of thing and i'll heckle them and they'll heckle me from stage and this sort of thing and that's great fun for me but if you turn up there and there's this like clearly everyone knows each other but it's this kind of sort of that can be very alienating so it's i mean like no one wants to turn up and for there to be a clique but, but it, can, it can be difficult for that to happen. And what I try and do at the Bastard Sessions is in the physical one, when people turn up, um, I'll often go up to people and I'll say, hi, have you, have you been before? Yeah. You know, I'm James, yeah, I'm yeah. running it. And yeah. they'll say, uh, yes, I've been like three or four times and we've had this conversation each time. Yeah. And I'll say, I'm sorry, I've already had two, I've already had three pints of cider. I'm like, <laughs> you know, so yeah. Anyway, sorry, I cut you off then when you were just talking about cliques, but I, I wanted to make that point yeah. that I think it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's like, not having a clique is a skill, not a decision, I think. Oh, quotable you know? quotes of the century. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah. Because, you know, yeah, once you get like a hardcore um, audience turning up. I mean, one of the other expressions that we've had in the Bastard session is there comes a point where we need, where we need to, what the expression is, we need to break the dude wall. Because mm. you will get a wall of dudes standing at the front playing kind of in a circle. 
I'm like, okay, like if if possible, if some women could just like step in here and whatever, it will help break the dude wall. And then once that happens, <laughs> other female performers will come. And, and that's that's very much the case. Like if if the dude wall remains unbroken after nine o'clock, no women will perform. But if if it's like almost kind of enforced, then it'll be like 60, 40, you know, if we're lucky. Um, cause, cause blokes are just always, I, when I was booking acts, I would always find that there was sort of the really talented female performers would be like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm like, I don't know if I'm good enough. I'm like, everyone thinks you're brilliant. Yeah. And, but like some guys been playing for five minutes and can play purple haze badly. It's like, I'm ready. I can do it now. Yeah. So I, I suppose, yeah, just, I, I suppose questions about the future, James, really. I mean, you uh -huh. know, obviously when you get to my age, you can say I've been doing it forever and I will do it to the day I yeah. drop dead probably. What, what about you? I mean, what's, what, what's your, what's the future looking like? Um, I guess, uh, I mean, long-term it's kind of more of the same, but I think it's a case of, I can't, because this isn't a, and I think, I don't think for anyone, it's like a, this sort of community music because it doesn't have a destination because yeah. you're so much reacting to how society is. It, it will go where that goes in future. I guess I can be more specific about the short term. Now, in terms of virtual rather than um, physical, I have embraced the sort of virtual side of things quite fully. I'm a bit of a tech head. I do enjoy this sort of stuff. The duet function on duet on, on TikTok is the thing that is exciting, I think. That's the thing where you can play with other people. Finally, like there hasn't been, and you don't have to do it live but you can yeah. kind of build up these sort of chains. And that's something I definitely want to play with. It's relevant because are you aware of the whole shanty talk phenomenon? Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So like, I'm trying to bring our session onto TikTok. This has been one of the latest things. And let me, um, it's now to the point where I'll say to my wife, do you want to know something interesting? And she says, if it's not about TikTok, yes. <laughs> um, so she's kind of, she has had enough of it. But um, one of the things about TikTok is that you can do these duets yeah. and so we're trying to That's see whether right. or not we yeah, can do yeah. tune tune duets and we've got like a couple up and running i mean we started basically last week so at some point today i'm going to nudge people and say come on more tunes we need more duets god damn it and, and this is my sort of thing to just be slightly come on everyone it's going to be great in terms of an online session i feel like we've tinkered with it quite a bit and my feeling is that like at the moment, unless something radical is introduced to it, I am concluding that it has got its one particular pro, which is that people all around the world can participate. But other than that, it is an inferior medium yeah, to yeah. being in the room. And, mm. and I, I feel like that's actually, you know, you know, the, the, it's such an important thing to be in the same space as other people, but sp something that's specifically for people that can't be there, that makes sense. But one of the lessons I drew from online is that online needs to be, for me, less frequent and less long. Yeah, so yeah. I think if I was going to do this, the bastard sessions that we do are once a month. Yeah. And we did try doing it kind of soon, you know, more, more frequently, but, but it helps to get that big kind of energy up. I think if I was going to, and I think I probably will keep doing the kind of online sessions, but I reckon I would probably move to quarterly. I would probably move to once every three months. Oh, We'd still yeah. do two hours. Yeah. And then if we did it quarterly, I would say, what are we feeling like? Do we, do we want to do this more regularly? Do we want to do this kind of once, once a month? Um, I think that it is like, it, it requires a certain amount of, it requires a, a, an unusual energy doing things in kind of on Zoom that I feel like when we get back to normal is going to seem a bit, you're going to perhaps be a bit less inclined to do the kind of online video. Yeah, but yeah. as I say, I feel like if it was, less frequent um and if it was like for two hours but it is this case of you will have that experience of talking to people all over the world and with these kind of sessions with a lot of the open mic stuff people will suddenly move to glasgow we'll move to new zealand we'll move to whatever and it, it is really nice to be able to do a kind of catch up yeah, um is, yeah. so so that's something that that I think I'll be looking at, but it will be very reactive. The future for me is going to be seeing where we are, I think. Mm. Um, you mentioned, should people be on social media? One of the curious things I think is that I feel like a lot of older people 
people in their 50s and 60s are maybe more comfortable with social media than people in their teens. Mm. A lot of people in their teens are just mm. like, like, I don't fully understand data harvesting, but I understand peer pressure. And the, like the two combined don't sound fantastic. And I remember the days of MySpace when like every teenager, <laughs> I mean, I remember, cause I sort of came on that in the twenties, every teenager who was on there had a literal thing of, you have this many friends. Yeah, there is a physical right. number. Yeah. Like yeah. the popular kid in school has got 12,000. You have eight. And people can look that up and see that, and it's brutal. And I feel like it's about celebrating the things to celebrate. And for me, that's community and alcohol within a certain amount. Like alcohol is so much of a part of the culture, but it is celebrating this kind of like two pint culture, yeah. not like twenty pints and then having to go to hospital and and then becoming an alcoholic when you're like thirty. Um, so it's celebrating the good things, but it's also acknowledging the bad things. It's it's kind of um, I mean, there's, there's obvious things about colonialism, but one of the things I'm really sort of waking up to is just how I spent my 30s just really enjoying BBC4 documentaries and really enjoying British history. And then after a while, I realized that I was just being fed like yeah. a very flattering kind of quite mm. narrow view. And there's a lot about the rest of the world I know nothing about. And so it's it's dealing with these things that I think is is like how you create a space that's going to be welcoming going forward um yeah i mean it's, kind of it's interesting isn't it? because we, we haven't really talked much about a kind of political dimension but mm. you know I've, I've always been a lefty so you know and there is a kind of given sense that the folk movement is full of you know woke lefty kind of lovely people i was gonna say i, I know one tory councillor who's a, like a hardcore folky he is like the only one. And yeah. he will often on his Facebook page say, I met that nice, like Jacob Rees-Mogg. And then there will just be this shitstorm of whatever. And he's like, why can people not be reasonable? I'm like, use your fucking head, pal. What do you think? Like, look at your friendship group, come on. The thing about the importance of having somewhere that welcomes you, you know, a venue, a pub yeah. or something, you know, it's critical, isn't it? So up in Beverly in, in Yorkshire, I went to the only yeah. session folk club I've ever been to held in a, conservative club yeah <laughs> what yeah. you know you sort of think if you tried to do that down our way none of our mates would go you know i mean just because of what it what says was, on the door what was it like what was the vibe it was there? fantastic the people couldn't be more friendly you, you know they couldn't be more welcoming yeah. i mean it was it was truly weird and of course one of the things yeah. that i wanted to write up because you know it's a story against myself isn't it and the terrible prejudice yeah. you have about but but the idea that the association was the weird thing in my head the, the room was full of people that looked like you and me and, and were singing songs yeah. that were all about you know bash the employers and stuff the uh, establishment in a conservative <laughs> club so the isis pub um the landlords are conservative voters they're lovely okay. people but i mean like i have never met a landlord a pub landlord that isn't a conservative voter probably except joe ryan um but i mean they'll be singing a <laughs> along with like i mean i try and like nominally keep it as a not political space but solidarity forever will come out and everyone and they'll be singing along with it as well so it is this kind of curious thing but a lot of the songs like a lot of the musical songs it's a very sort of fox hunting mm -hmm. uh like we don't uh we, uh we don't want to fight but by jingo if we do all well, that's sort yeah, of yeah. like slightly kipling -y stuff it's also part of it it's a it's a funny kind of thing so um started going on the folk scene in about 20, 2006 2007 and um i noticed it growing and growing and growing what really shifted that was brexit yeah. And I noticed it sort of fell off a cliff. Yeah. And even though, and I'm sort of following various other kind of folk musicians who are like, I don't know how to relate to Englishness as a result of this. And that's been one of the things that, I mean, so we were kind of trying to find ways of, of, of dealing with this in the, in, in the session. We were sort of saying, well, we want to actually have more people singing in other languages. We want to, we want to still very much be English, be interested in an English identity, but broaden what it is and make it more inclusive but it was this case of just it was kind of had this toxicity to it mm. and then a scottish postman sings a shanty and then suddenly like in a moment the whole thing kind of flips and everyone's just like oh sea shanties and it's shanties rather than english folk music that's yeah, big that's right, but yeah. a lot of them are english songs and and suddenly this thing kind of picks up again so i think it's the case of people recognize that it's community music 
yeah. what you call this thing that we do. Yeah. Like for years, I was like, I'm not sure whether or not I'd really call myself folk. I'm not sure if it's more traditional or is it even more historical? And now I'm just like, it's folk. You said I've been <laughs> recording this, James. I hope that's cool because I'll, I'll transcribe that's fine. The, the fruity bits. Yeah. Is that okay? That's that's fine. Did I slag right. off the government? I can't remember. Probably. Okay. I'm going to scoot. Lovely yeah. to talk to you. Thanks, mate. Catch you later. Bye. Thanks to James Bell for that uh, fascinating romp through how to run a fairly unusual session. You know, James has got a particularly radical approach, which I happen to love. I think it's fantastic. Um, what we're going to do in this series, though, is really get uh, a look at all the different types of sessions and sing arounds they are, from very traditional through to the kind of eclectic and madcap that's uh, typified by James and quite a few of the others around the country, actually. So in this series, you know, we're going to look at all sorts of variations on what's happening in pubs and community centres near you. And if you want to have your session featured, then get in contact. The website addresses are on the uh, screen that's going to come next. And uh, yeah, see you next time.